Good morning. We are going to start promptly because we have a really full morning for y'all, uh, full of awesomeness and information and wisdom, all these things. So welcome to Houston Oasis. We are a community of compassion and reason. Uh, we are an alternative to faith-based communities. And behind me, to your left, you can see our core values, including people are more important than beliefs. Uh, my name is Will, and it is my pleasure to be your MC today. Um, before I get into the uh, formalities, um, I just want to take a second to welcome all the new people. And this is spectacular. I know we have a uh, pretty cool speaker, but it still uh, uh, makes my cold heart smile to see all these new people come in. And you all have been coming in kind of lately. So for the newbies, I just want to let you know that uh, Oasis is basically a safe place for you to be around people, like-minded people. So if you're left religion, if you're questioning religion, or if you're a believer and just kind of want to hang out with these people, well, these non-believers, what are they about? Or a separation of church and state? I thought that was a myth. Um, everyone's welcome here. And we have uh, speakers most weeks. We have uh, volunteer events. We have social events. And thank you for plugging into the secular world. Houston Oasis is one of a couple of groups at Houston, and there's, there's Houston Oasis, uh, there's uh, Secular Houston, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. There's multiple groups in town, that, and it's a really vibrant, good time to be in the secular world. There's a lot of going on. So plug in to any of these groups. You can plug in to Houston Oasis. Again, it's going to be a good area for you to uh, meet like-minded people. Houston Oasis is not an activist uh, platform, but if you wish to, if you do have some activism energy, I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but you can contact me because I'm kind of more of an activist favorite. I'm taking my Oasis hat off and that's just me, Will, up here. So you can contact me if you want to do some stuff in the real world and I can point you in the right direction. I can channel that energy to a more effective way through a secular prison. I'm done. So putting my uh, Oasis hat back on. We have got a terrific lineup for you today, which I think most of you here know. Our uh, musical guest, guests are uh, Jonathan Duvall and Bob Sutton. And our featured speaker is, what's Seth? What? Seth Andrews, that's his name, host of The Thinking Atheist. Our main speaker also has some merchandise back there. Um, fun fact, he kind of wants to get rid of these mugs. He doesn't want to travel back to Oklahoma with the mugs. So it says $10 on the thing, put a dollar, put $2, put five, uh, whatever you want, but uh, take a mug, please. So let me introduce our main speaker. Um, Seth Andrews is a former evangelical and Christian broadcaster who now hosts The Thinking Atheist, one of the most popular podcasts and online atheist communities in the world. Um, could go on and on about... Uh, how great he is, but I think we all, pretty much all of us know that he's a super cool cat, wonderful storyteller, and he is going to tell us about enlightenment, about the purity culture and why it's so icky. Yesterday was kind of a tough day. I, I, I'll spare you the details, but is every rock, nail, and screw in the state of Texas lying on the highways? So I've got a crack this big right next to my view, and I've got to drive eight hours in 100 degrees, and I'm all paranoid, like, will it spider out? Like, will it get, I'm not a glass expert. I told Natalie, I'm like, well, when I get home tonight, your windshield may be in the front seat and I may have very wild hair. So anyway, thank you uh, so much. It was cool though. I mean, after a crazy day, I got a chance. Will Judy, who is a dear friend, allowed me to hang out at his pad and I slept in the softest bed and woke up this morning to uh, like eggs and muffins and hot coffee. And it was like unbelievable. It's cool. Uh, by the way, you're all invited to stay the night at Will Judy's house tonight. Huge thanks to Houston Oasis. 
an organization committed to bringing people together. More and more in my own work, I've been talking about humanity, right? Shared values, as we would say in the church, doing life together. We just want to do life together and to see all of these uh, faces of not just friends, but family is it's huge. And I'll be riding that wave all the way home today. Thank you so much for coming. Does anyone here in this audience remember their first kiss? See a few smiles, a few hands, a couple of scowls. I remember my first kiss. Her name was Belin. I met Belin in my hometown of Tulsa. I was 14. And my mother thought it would be a really good idea for my twin sister and I to develop a good work ethic well before we were of legal age to work. We weren't 16, but let's go develop a good ethic to prepare them and it will fill the time during the summers. And so we were part of a volunteer youth work program called Junior Guild for a local hospital. Think of it as kind of a candy striper 2.0. We did a little bit more, but it was that kind of thing. And all the teenage volunteers had to wear these green smocks. And oh, lovely Berlin rocked this smock. We both got assigned to the ninth floor St. John's Hospital, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we just delivered IV bags and ran errands and got paperwork and whatever. And then when we had a few minutes of downtime, we had a chance to hang out and just chat and become friends. Beline was a vision, my friends. She was, this is not Beline, all right? I didn't save a picture of her from 40 some years ago. But this stock photo, I think, captures a lot of what I found so intriguing about her, what captured her in my imagination, that light and lovely complexion and those ocean blue eyes and that blonde hair that she said she washed in lemon to give it that special sheen. And I don't even know if that's true, but it was beautiful and I thought it was amazing. She had a genetic hearing loss and so her consonant sounded a little bit different when she spoke and it just gave her an even further endearing quality in her teeth. Her teeth much too perfect for a 15 year old. And oh yeah, since I was 14 and she was 15, Belin was an older woman. Oh yeah. Our job was to run errands, which meant we were always taking the elevator. And on one special day that summer, I noticed she was standing almost close enough to touch me. I did not move away. The next ride, I stood over closer to her. She did not move away. The next elevator ride, we were shoulder to shoulder. And the next elevator ride, we kissed. That moment was electric. It was electric. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was doing it, right? A few seconds of stolen passion before ding, and the elevator door opened and we walked out like nothing was going on. Of course, my next thought was, we need to run more errands. We need to run more errands. The long, hot summer, I will never forget it. But sadly, when the summer was over, we both sort of parted and went on to our separate lives. Still, she was my first. She will always be my first. That was four decades ago. Very fond memories for me but I have not yet said anything about the dark side of young passions when you are brought up in a culture of shame. In high control religions, shame is constant. There you are at puberty or beyond and you are a walking, talking, throbbing teenage hormone, right? Supercharged, you're supercharged with fantasies about physical touch and passionate touch sensual touch and on one hand it feels natural and right and good and in the other hand it plays in the other hand it feels sinful and carnal and in that hand of course they place the bible right 
in that hand someone places a Bible. I was 14. I had already broken the command of Matthew 5.28. I had looked at a woman lustfully in my heart. 14 years old. I'm already an adulterer. Oh, great. That's a great start. I had felt desires in my youth, evil desires. I'd failed in righteousness, according to 2 Timothy. I was captivated by Beline. I was captivated by her eyes and her face and her voice and her shape, her laugh, her mind, her heart, her person. I'd broken the command of Proverbs 6. Hardline Christianity had turned my personal, natural, hetero attraction to females into a minefield. I was going to say booby trapped, but I'm just sorry. I say booby trapped. Purity culture breeds dysfunction. It takes creatures of innate desire and it commands them to not desire. How should this be done? Well, first of all, you have to make a promise to God and often to God's proxy, which is going to be the head of the household in Christian culture. It was usually the male, the father figure. And it's no accident that I've used a girl in this slide. Abstinence programs like True Love Weights encourage young people to wear purity rings. Anybody heard of these? This one, by the way, says waiting for the one. Isaiah 4031 talks about God renewing your strength. When you feel lustful and sinful, God will renew your strength. There are purity balls. These are ceremonies where young girls are actually dressed in wedding gowns and formally vow sexual chastity often specifically to their fathers. Here is a young girl at a purity ball. She is actually signing a stay of virgin contract under the eyes of her Christian father. Some cultures actually call this dating your dad. And are you ready for the veins to pop out of your face, my friends? Back in 2014, ABC Nightline did a whole feature on this. Check this out. I need audio. Just leave it up. If you Ron has a Just leave it up and uh, it'll fire automatically. Nice and loud. Meanwhile, Ron has a special gift for Caroline before they all head to the ball. I'm ready for you, dear. You look lovely. Well, you are uh, growing up before your daddy's eyes. One of the things that you were talking to daddy about uh, was... When am I going to get my purity ring? And uh, one of the things that I think is important for us to remember is this is your desire to do it the Lord's way, to really save yourself from kissing lots, lots of toads along the way and wait for your Prince Charming to come along. And he's got to pass through your dad. Uh, and dad's got to put the stamp of approval on him because uh, dads are really smart and they can separate princes from toads really well. Let me uh, show you the ring that I got for you here. And when somebody comes along who is ready and has the proper character and will treat you like a queen, then that's the guy that passes the test. And until then, this is just a reminder. Keeping yourself pure is important. And so you keep that on your finger. And it's a daily reminder that you're at this point, you're married to the Lord. And uh, and your father is your boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have fun together. Your father is your boyfriend. And we're going to have fun together. And this thinking carries well beyond your teenage years, often into adulthood. It's one of the reasons that we have the tradition today, often an innocuous one in this context, where the father gives away the bride. I officiated a wedding in Kentucky where we changed the language because the bride wanted her father involved. But we said, who presents this bride? Because they were equals. And it was her choice, but she wanted her father involved. But you can see the whole idea, the patriarchal idea that she is accountable to her father, who is God's proxy. It's misogynistic. It's controlling. It's culty. You think that's culty. Check this out. This is an actual marriage ball with an actual cross in the room. And girls in wedding gowns kneel in submission before the cross to vow sexual chastity. Okay, next up, cover up. That ought to fix things. This is actually an illustration that I grabbed from the WikiHow page called How to Dress 
modestly. Notice that how the covering of the woman's shoulders just automa- magically removes all temptation to lust and sin. It really is amazing. Because, of course, women are the gatekeepers for preventing lust and sin. The Apostle Paul, not exactly an egalitarian, commands women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. Now, I was a kid in Christian school, and one of those years, I was part of the ACE program, the Accelerated Christian Education Program, which is quite terrifying. And this is the kind of stuff that was in the books. This is an illustration teaching young girls how to dress. First frame, the girl covered says, look nice, looks nice. Second frame, looks good. No, no, a little knee in the third frame, too little to wear. I must look right always. If I can boil this down to bullet points, the great wisdom here is don't think like a slut, don't dress like a slut, don't be a slut, and don't be tempted by the slut. By the way, who is the target for most of these instructions? Of course, it's the woman. And the perception has long been that men, more than women, are sexually activated visually, so we have to mute what men see. By the way, there's some science on this. There are some neuroscientists who have examined who have examined the brain. They challenge the claim that men are primarily visual while women are not. There are actual uh, interesting science published in a 2019 article saying that both male and female brains respond to visual stimuli. Uh, Other research says that male primates still more rely on visual cues for choosing a mate that is reproductively fit. This is all rooted in our evolution. I don't think it's controversial to say that most male primates do lead with their eyes. However, as male primates, we don't have to be slaves to the amygdala. I narrated the uh, book by Dr. Hector Garcia, where we talked about male primates, including the male primate and these tendencies toward aggression and dominance behaviors, you know, that sort of chest thumping thing that men do. And uh, there's some science on that. They, science on that, Mike, shit, science on that. David Michael Buss is an American evolutionary psychologist. He's also an expert in human sex differences and mate selection. And he makes a necessary point that a scientific description of evolved behaviors is not the same as a moral prescription for that behavior. Not every evolved trait is a civilized one, and we have evolved the conscious ability to override old programming. In other words, we can experience and acknowledge the evolutionary triggers that draw the eye toward a beautiful person while choosing not to entertain and engage in objectification, obsession, or predation. Stuff gets really complicated, but it's true, with exceptions, visually oriented primate males are biologically and socially primed for aggression and dominance behaviors. This model sees male behaviors excused, dominance behaviors expected, while females are subjugated, blamed, and shamed. And if you want a great example of this, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, right? The story of Christianity starts with this attitude. Eve is produced as a byproduct of Adam. She's subordinate to Adam. She had tempted Adam to taste the forbidden fruit. How did God punish her? Sexually. I will surely expand your pain and your pregnancy. In pain, you will bear children, and against your husband will be your desire, but he should rule over you. In fundamentalist Christianity, this is known as Eve's curse, right? Pregnancy and uh, childbirth hurt like a mother, and you will desire your husband. This is part of a curse that root, that roots back to Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's weird. It's almost like the story was written by men. It's a strange coincidence. Bizarre. Lilith, she's only mentioned once in the Christian Bible, but ancient Babylonian tradition and some Christian traditions know Lilith as the first wife of Adam. She came before Eve. She was a piece of work. She was confident, sexually liberated. She knew what she wants. She took what she wanted. Not submissive, 
much too independent for God and Adam. This isn't going to work. So she was ousted. She was cast out of the garden as a demonic seducer to make way for the more submissive Eve. The Bible has Delilah. She seduced and betrayed Samson. His life totally destroyed when she cut his hair and stole his divine power. The alluring Jezebel convinced King Ahab to worship the false god Baal and kill the prophets of Yahweh. The book of Revelation has a female destroyer adorned in gold and pearls, riding the scarlet beast, holding a cup filled with fornication. She is the mother of harlots, the whore of Babylon. Even the Christian apocalypse myth has an adorned female seductress bringing destruction. Oh, you women, you are the sirens and you beckon us men into calamity. How dare you? More skin equals more sin. And it's all your fault. We see a lot of this in fundamentalist Islam. Ton of this kind of thing. By the decree of men, women are to be covered, often totally. Why? According to the Quran, so they will not be abused. Who would be doing the abusing? So we victim blame them. We try to desexualize them so that they will not be abused. And I need to clarify something here. I've used the word desexualize a few times. It's actually ironic because the effect is the opposite. The more you target people sexually first and then try to mute that and desexualize them, the more objectified they become, right? Uh, purity culture really does show its own hand in that way. The more it targets females with modesty sermons, the more it actually sexualizes females. Okay, here's an alarming example of purity culture out of the Mormon church. A few years ago, this was a video shown at something called the LDS Youth Standards Night. And these young men took the One Direction song, You Don't Know You're Beautiful, and they retooled it. Prepare yourself for cringe. Oh, don't pick your man. We keep it virtuous, baby. Dressing modest, we know it's rough. When the world is making it so tough, uh -oh. don't need short skirts or low cut shirts. Being the way that you are is enough. That's right, baby. Everyone seems to care. Everyone You should see your faces. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? You'd understand why I need your modesty. Anyone else think that sounds alarmingly rapey? Cover up. I need you to cover up. You are the gatekeeper for how I think and what I do. At the very least, it's saying women are responsible for how men act and react in a sexual way. Purity culture's obsession with females primes males in ways that they may not even realize. Now, please understand that I'm not generalizing all men, young men especially, into a predator category, although we do see it. We see it a lot. It happens far too often. But males are often the victims of purity culture. I wasn't a predator when I was a devout evangelical, but I was a victim of purity culture and fed some very bad ideas. They tried to desexualize me. I was blamed and shamed. I took a purity pledge. I didn't wear any rings, but I took a purity pledge, which I struggled with for years 
and years. Boys are often biblically brainwashed for dominion. This is a parent training guide. It was produced by Focus on the Family. That's James Dobson's outfit. It was written by a minister. This is an actual guidebook for fathers on how to raise a modern day knight. And of course, knights must wear armor. This is in the Bible, by the way. Put on the armor of God. You need the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith. The shoes of peace are the feet of peace. And of course, you must carry the sword of the spirit. By the way, I was sent a video clip of one Christian man literally wielding a sword of the spirit. This is from Storehouse Church in Jasper, Alabama. Okay, beyond the fact that he almost decapitated his own pastor, that's a penis, right? That's a penis. A projection of male fierceness and chest-banging warrior power, sexual strength, dominating. These are rites of passage, tests of virtue. These are sacred oaths, holy quests. He is a man on a mission. The 1990s saw the rise of the promise, uh, the promise keepers movement. This was a revival just for men. We saw tens of thousands of men packing into uh, football stadiums to commit themselves to godly manhood. And the model for that was this. Men are the final word, the authority in the home. There is sex only in marriage. And of course, as Yahweh is a heterosexual man's man, he wants the same attributes in boys, young men's, husbands, fathers, etc. Be strong, be solid, and be masculine. Of course, we're not talking about masculinity in the healthy sense, which is wonderful. Masculinity is wonderful, natural, normal. I have to make that clear. But the hierarchy model in many fundamentalist cultures is one of toxic masculinity. We see men tragically trained into distorted notions of manhood. You can ask the women in this room about the mansplainers. Anyone here met a mansplainer? That's all right. I, I, I see. Yes, I see that hand. That's another church thing. I see that hand. Yes. Thank you so much. Chauvinism. Male dominance. Let me tell you how it is, little lady. I play tennis, right? Natalie and I are on the tennis court and I will actually hear some guys go, well, we gave them that point. You got to let the girls have a point. Yeah, let the girls win. And I'm looking at them and the level of talent going, those girls whip your ass. I'm just saying. Okay. How many boys and men are terrified of being called what they consider to be the ultimate insult? You're so gay, you fag, you queer, gay men. They're not true men. I've seen this even in atheist cultures. I've seen this across the board, across the human spectrum. I've had this happen in my own circle, right? I'll release a podcast or a video, a speech, something, and someone will say something really, really kind. I love Seth's voice. Oh, thank you. It, what a lovely sentiment. It means a lot to me. It warms my heart. Thank you so much. But they can't leave it there. The guy then includes no homo. How insecure is that statement? No homo, right? I don't want him sexually. I'm just, I'm just, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea about me, right? Well, that comes from somewhere. Non-heterosexual men, they are not men, not really. No, no, men, back in the day, that's men, men, raw, male, primal power, yeah. Those were the people who ruled the moments. And I have to remind these people that, yeah, that's true, but there were other types of men who also lived in the halls of power, and they looked like this. Look, at today they're going after the drag queens for wearing makeup and wigs. And you're like, have you read your history? Are you even mildly observant? What the hell is wrong with you? History is filled with these men. 
There's the whole men don't cry attitude. Right? It conflates healthy human vulnerability with weakness. Don't you cry? I'll give you something to cry about. Toughen up. Suck it up. That's what men do. This kind of thinking happens a lot. And of course, the grunting displays of noble aggression. This is how we solve problems. I'll meet you in the parking lot, man. You want to go? You want to? Yeah, you will settle this like men, right? You find a lot of people who are emotional infants, and the only tool set they have for problem solving is this shallow physical response. It's tragic. Male assertions of power, and they are very often sexual, like the guy with the sword. We got this guy. That's a penis, right? That is a penis. The AR-15 he's carrying around sums up 21st century biblical manhood. You mark your territory, you puff out your chest, give them the thousand yard stare, and of course, show them what you got, which is a gun penis. That's all I see when I see that photograph. Have you noticed how many insults toward women are often degrading sexual slurs when the insults toward men so often are not? I mean, make a list. You'll find exceptions, but make a list of the popular insults thrown at men and the popular insults thrown at women. It's not even close, not even close. Women frequently valued and devalued sexually first. Here's another example of the double standard. The man has a lot of sex partners. He's a playboy. He's a womanizer. He's a play a player, right? Hey, just being a guy. Woman does it. She's a slut, a whore, a tramp, a bimbo, etc. I've seen talk like this far beyond religion. It is a human problem. What about good people who struggle through the indoctrination of sexual stereotypes and they're overwhelmed by, they're overwhelmed by all the blaming and the shaming and the control, this idea that they have to submit, right? I'm a dependent to the authority and I must submit myself, mind and body to the church body. Anybody here familiar with the phenomenon of church discipline? This is insidious. People of all ages are told they have to report their moral failures to the pastor and the entire congregation of a church. So let's say it's discovered you had sex outside of marriage. That's adultery. You had an affair or you were caught with porn or you're not a heterosexual or whatever. Parents and pastors drag you before the entire church where you have to confess your sin, repent publicly, and then promise you will not do it again. You are being watched. You will be held accountable. Now, I'm not talking about accountability in the sense that maybe you're struggling with something and you need a support system. Let's say you're recovering from addiction. So you've got someone you can reach out to who encourages you and helps to hold you up in difficult moments. I don't even think that's accountability. That's community, really. I'm talking about accountability in the more Orwellian sense. Somebody else is being aware of your most personal private struggles so that they can direct you to the right path. They help to distract you, pray away your weaknesses and your struggle, intercede to God for you, but also to surveil and report. If you blow it, there will be consequences. How far do some churches take this? Well, check out this example. A friend of mine told me this story. He attend, attended a church in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the pastor gave a sermon about sexual sins, and he got to the part of the sermon about masturbation. And he targeted that part of the sermon specifically to the men in the auditorium because apparently only men masturbate. Yeah, right. The pastor came up with an ingenious way to protect men from this particular sin. And I am not making this up. He assigned masturbation partners. By the way, this is why you should never pose for stock photos. These four guys have no idea when they posed for a stock image that I was going to do this to them in Houston, Texas. No, I did not actually do a casting call for masturbator. This is a stock image. Okay. So here's the idea. You are now tempted to engage in the devil's handshake. Okay. And you realize, oh, no, I am now lusting. God is watching. How do I resist 
the fantasy and the physical touch, I call a buddy and I confess. And this is apparently supposed to produce a kind of cold shower effect. You know, if you pray with a partner, then you won't punch the munchkin. Okay, so this is insanity. It's insanity. It is also genius. If you control someone's sexual identity, you've got the whole person, who they are, what they think, how they live, who they love, if they self-love. By the way, you have not lived until you have researched Victorian area, Victorian era masturbation preventions. These are actual devices that they would fit on men because they were warning that masturbation could lead to all kinds of horrors, mental illness, physical diseases, the sickness of sin could even kill you if you sell pleasure. And so back in the 1800s, doctors and priests would prescribe these horrible contraptions that were supposed to prevent erections. And there were plenty of other versions that were fitted to women, just horrible. Anyway, okay, we have already established that God likes to watch, all right? We've already, biblical sex is always a threesome. We know this, okay? How sadistic is the God model for human sexuality? Let's say puberty hits at 12. The median age for marriage in this country is around 30. That's 18 years where any sex would be premarital sex. 18 years of innate desire that people are told to support. Almost two decades at war with a body that God intelligently designed to sexually activate early. But wait, the church has a remedy for that. If you don't think you can wait, get married as soon as you can. First Corinthians says if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. How many very young people jumped into the marriage bed because they were sold the lie that physical intimacy was illegitimate unless they picked somebody and signed the papers? And for many, the honeymoon night is a nightmare. People are terrified when they walk into the bedroom. They've been taught nothing of value about themselves or their partners. They feel dirty and carnal. Even when the church says, well, now it's okay. Now it's godly sex. No, no, they still carry sexual shame into the marital bedroom. This is supposedly godly sex, but it feels so wrong. Intimate moments that are supposed to be exciting and amazing become scary and awkward, and traumatizing. Purity couples literally fumbling in the dark, sometimes realizing too late that they're not even compatible, but now they're committed, they're locked in, trapped, disappointed, depressed, miserable. Let's say the legal age of marriage in the state is 18. How much do you know about yourself when you're 18? How much did I know about myself when I was 18? Right? You're barely out of high school. You haven't gone to college if that's what you want. If you had a job, it probably wasn't a career. You hadn't navigated any adult relationships. How could you know anybody else? You were still getting to know yourself. Gone is the chance to take your time and test the waters and figure things out beyond the cocoon of youth. Loss is the chance to learn and grow and mature through experience. The law said, you're ready. Pre-marriage workshop said, you're ready. The pastor at the podium said, you're ready. You are not ready. And then comes the joy of Christian marriage counseling, right? Somebody else walks in the room, some third party, and says, this is a spiritual problem. You need to pray more, study the Bible more, open up to each other and to Jesus, submit Try harder in the bedroom if you just try harder. What does all this communicate? Communicates the problem is you. It's internal. It's your fault. Divorce in many churches is treated with compassion. There are many people who genuinely show love and goodness and empathy and support to people going through divorce or scarred by divorce. And I appreciate that. But there's still real problems with biblical divorce. If you believe in a soulmate, how could you ever take a second spouse? 
Or if your second spouse was supposed to be your lifelong soulmate, does that mean the first spouse was adultery? It's just so dysfunctional. And even the well-meaning divorce recovery workshops usually frame it as a problem of the spirit, not a compatibility problem. What if it's a safety problem? I'm unsafe with my partner but I can't get out because God will be displeased. It's tragic. Perhaps most ironic is the reality that so many of these holy rollers that preach against unbiblical sex so often get caught with their own pants down. Have you noticed that? Everywhere. We see it everywhere. Everywhere from the corner church to the mega church. They preach from God's house, but their own house has a closet that is loaded with skeletons. And then comes the mea culpa. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I was weak. I was in the flesh. They caught me. They caught me with porn. They caught me in a hotel with a partner, maybe even a same-sex partner. I have been literally exposed. I was banging something that wasn't my Bible. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I beg forgiveness from all of you. Oh, and from Lord God above. Purity hypocrites are everywhere we look, especially from the pulpit. There's a great quote by Christopher Hitchens from his book, Hitch 22, and he summed it up. He said, whenever I hear some big mouth in Washington or the Christian heartland banging on about the evils of sodomy or whatever, I mentally enter his name in my notebook and contentedly set my watch. Sooner rather than later, he will be discovered down on his weary and well-worn old knees in some dreary motel or latrine with an expired visa card, having tried to pay well over the odds to be peed upon by some Apache transvestite. You see somebody who's screaming morality, morality, purity, purity, set your watch and wait. Beyond the four tongues of the do as I say crowd, it is remarkable to think that whole generations have been convinced to give somebody else the keys to their private spaces. Their private thoughts and desires and attractions and choices and partners and relationships and families for their entire lives. So many of us, especially those who came out of Fundy faiths, we just bowed and complied. It's the authority and we must submit. We didn't realize we have the right to square our shoulders and tell these people, this is none of your business. And a lot of people still struggle with this even today after a lifetime of being told how to live and who to be by somebody else. Oh, if I could get in a time machine, talk to the younger Seth, I would have some advice for me. And it might resonate with you. Maybe this is something that will, uh, you know, be interesting to you. Maybe uh, something you can take back with you in your own journey. I don't know, but I'll just tell you what I'm thinking. I get in my way back machine and I talk to my young Seth. Uh, counterpart and i say this first piece of advice never take sex ed from clergy right don't take sex ed from clergy second piece of advice christian purity culture is kidding itself abstinence only programs constantly fail and this has been studied The Journal of Adolescent Health reported that just telling kids to cross your legs and pray and be holy and be pure doesn't delay sex. It does not reduce risky behaviors. It is a trespass on the individual. It fuels dangerous ignorance. It stigmatizes young people. It reinforces harmful gender stereotypes, and it makes the problems of unwanted pregnancies and STDs even Worse, And the fact that many of these purity culture parents and pastors are sincere, and many of them are, they genuinely care. They're worried about the safety and good health and futures of their children. And so they're convinced they're doing the right thing. Sincerity doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. Many times they're simply downloading the same dysfunction into their kids that was downloaded into them. I would tell myself about how much of purity culture is about control. This is controversial for some. Christianity likes to say it's about freedom. If you read the Bible, Christianity and all fundamentalist faiths are about control. Surrender. 
What are you surrendering? The self. John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. We've seen the t-shirts and the memes. Die to self, live for Jesus. More of Jesus, less of me. I surrender all. What are we surrendering? It's a surrender of the self. And lest you think the modern church is not still infected with this nonsense, let me introduce you to podcaster, author, and influencer on Instagram. Her name is Allie B. Stuckey. She posted a helpful little sermonette in March of 2022. I probably sound like a broken record to a lot of you, but because this is a message that keeps on showing up in Christian women's circles, I feel like I need to say it again. You are not enough. You're not enough. Nowhere does the Bible say that you are sufficient. Nowhere does the Bible say that you're perfect the way you are. And that is good news. It's actually great news. You know why? Because you're not enough. You never will be. But Jesus is. Ali Stuckey has given herself permission to say this, to devalue people. Purity culture has given itself permission to say this, to devalue and control you, but they do not have permission unless we gift it to them. Next piece of advice would be to my young self, do some solo runs. This is a weird one for a shy guy like myself. But in this country, 92% of men, 76% of women self-pleasure. No, you are not ruining yourself or your partner. You're not shredding the moral fabric of society. Jesus isn't up there taking Polaroids for Judgment Day going, holy shit, you remember this? This is just so embarrassing. He's not. You're not going to go blind or grow hair on your palms. Did anyone ever hear that growing up? If you masturbate, you'll go blind or you'll have airy palms. Just such a bizarre threat. Anyway. It's your body. This is natural. It's normal. It's okay. They can build confidence as well as you get to know your own body. Have fun with it. I'm kind of a conservative guy personally, but uh, if you happen to be the more adventurous type, eh, great. Explore that space on your own terms. You know, have fun. Go hang from the chandelier. Who cares? And if some clucking conservative church hen shows up and she starts to judge you for role playing and costumes and kink and a closet full of toys or whatever, just assure them, you know what? My trip to the adult store actually boosts capitalism. Right? Jesus loves capitalism. Jesus loves capitalism. Yeah. The next piece of advice I'd give myself is something totally counter to the teachings of my former church, but it's critical. Seth, you should have premarital sex. Sexual compatibility or incompatibility should not be a honeymoon surprise. How in the world do you make a sexual commitment to someone without sexual experience? Why pledge to a partner when you don't fully know your partner? And here's another tip that my Christian counselors would roll their eyes at. Live together. I am convinced you can never truly know someone until you have lived in the same space, right? Because you've gone past that. Oh, they're just perfect. We never fight. Oh, they're just the most wonderful people. It's just so amazing. It's like, wow. And then you live in the same space and you see each other without the veneer. And you're like, whoa, hey, wait a minute. Sometimes it's a pleasant surprise. Sometimes being able to share all the parts of ourselves for better and worse actually create greater intimacy. You know, I feel safe enough with you to open my life up, imperfections and all to you. I trust you with that part of myself. It can be beautiful, but it can also reveal real problems. Live with someone before you make any long-term commitment, if that's what you desire. And if you don't desire to sign a marriage contract, that is just fine. You don't have to have a legal piece of paper to be a family. No document determines family. No religion has to sanction family. No mother, father, pastor, priest, politician, doctrine, authority can invalidate your family. And if anybody tries, you just give them this warning. You say, access is denied to you. 
You do not have permission. I am the admin of my page. And I had to adjust my own thinking on this. It's hard, you know, it's hard to understand that you can draw boundaries and enforce them. It was hard for somebody who came out of an authoritarian culture. And I became liberated. And this permission structure can apply to our whole lives, not just sex, everything. Oh, you don't agree with my interests? You don't like my clothing? My language bothers you? You don't agree with my career choices or sexual orientation? Or friends or partners or lack of partners? Does Fire to have children or not have children. You don't like my politics. Don't like my philosophies, my religion, my rejection of religion, who I am. That's a problem for you. Well, let me dial 911 and call the ambulance and you can take a nice long ride on it, right? I know it's a little snarky to say that, but it's not easy. I know it's not easy with family. There's a lot of layers to that onion, but it still applies. If you're uncomfortable with who I am, that is not. Changing my mind, adjusting my perspective, permissions to myself, to be myself, liberated me, liberated me. I would tell my young self, get some actual sex ed, like close your Bible, get out of the church, go understand what's going on. How is the body acting and reacting? What are the hormones doing? What's that about? We learn about organs and orgasms and contraception and protecting against unwanted pregnancies and STDs and setting up and observing the boundaries of consent. Get some real legit sex ed. I would tell myself to embrace the wide human spectrum of legitimate love in this world. Man, I spent decades judging, judging. I was just a bigot. I'd like to go back and just say, you are diminishing yourself. You are cheating yourself by not seeing the beauty of the people around you and celebrating them for the independent individuals, the unique human beings that they are. Cast all that judgment off. Get rid of it. Walk away from it. it would have saved me so much time. I wish I'd gotten there sooner. Finally, I guess I tell myself that Baleen was a gift. That memory is a gift. No shame, no judgment. Those precious, passionate seconds alone together were a gift. I cherish them and I embrace them and enjoy them even now. And I still kind of lean into that moment. What happened perfectly normal, the beginning of a natural and wonderful journey. And I think a real important part of feeling truly alive. And I know some people in this room can relate to what we've talked about today. I know some of you have come out of some pretty hard stuff and you all have your own stories to tell. Maybe you still bear some of the scars, scars that you'll carry with you for the rest of your life. For some, there might still be some open wounds from the damage caused by the controllers and the blamers and the shamers. In some ways, maybe you still feel like damaged goods. So let me leave you with this. No matter how much Bible the Puritans throw at you, remember how wrong the Bible has been about everything else. Bible has been wrong about biology, demonstrably wrong about cosmology, geography, meteorology, prophecy, history, morality, equality, humanity. Why in the world would we expect the Bible to be right about sin? Christian purity culture is built on a Bible that was written by anonymous, primitive, sexist men who probably couldn't find the clitoris with GPS. Just. And the ultimate act of emancipation is to stare down the controllers and say, no, you stop right there. You don't get to decide how I should feel, what I should think, where I should go, who I should choose or how I should live, my sexuality, my identity, my person, my choices, my relationships, my boundaries, my life. These things belong to me. And I set the rules and I can enforce them. And if you ever bump into evangelist Allie Stuckey on the street and she looks at you and tries to tell you that you are not enough, just assure her that you are enough and you know that. And then say, you know, Allie, you look a little tense. And since I'm now a liberated mind with a liberated body, 
My advice to you for relieving that tension is to go home and fuck yourself. Thank you all very much for having me out today. Appreciate it. The first question comes from online. And these are going to be super quick, y'all, because we're in a time crunch. How do you perceive the presence and persistence of purity culture ideas, particularly toxic masculinity, in secular circles where explicit adherence or support to purity culture is absent? Despite the absence of religious foundations, certain behaviors reminiscent of purity culture continue to linger. What are your thoughts on this phenomenon and any thoughts on how to address it within our bubble or secular world it's funny i just uh, had a conversation about that because i think i'd mentioned during the speech that it goes far beyond religion we see purity thinking ideas of tox toxic masculinity throughout the human spectrum and atheists are not immune from this type of thinking i follow a woman named uh, aaron lewis who has written books that talk about uh, the problems of Puritanism, even within secular cultures. And I recommend you follow her work as well. I myself think we lead by example. I think we uh, call out the toxic when we see it, including the people who, you know, if a guy walks in and he's being misogynistic or he's being homophobic or whatever. I think we uh, reinforce the antithesis of that by saying, well, that's inappropriate and that's actually not true. You know, these people are legitimate. We all are all equals. We all have value. And this whole idea of what you are broadcasting may not be helpful. And let me tell you why. But I think we lead by example. How do we fix the whole thing? I don't know. I think it's just situational one at a time. Is there somebody else? I'm going to make this super fast. By the way, I just was just introduced to some people who ambled in by accident and they had no idea who I was. And they said, uh, who are you? And so real fast, I host a website called The Thinking Atheist. I am not the thinking atheist, right? I'm the guy who wore black long sleeves to Houston in July. The thinking atheist is an idea. I come out of a faith culture, right? You know it because you believe it. And I think faith is a terrible way of finding out what's true. And so I wanted to promote reason let's think about these things we don't have to be great phd scientists but let's just engage brain and so that's what the thinking atheist is it's not a person it's an icon there's anybody else i don't like q a I, it's more about exchanging ideas yes yes yeah i'm pointing at someone yes just scream at me because i don't see a hand or anything oh. was that it am i are we that good We've already fixed the world. That's amazing. Hasn't your trip been worth it? Final thought from me. I spend most of my time in a studio with a mic. My stuff goes out and I occasionally get an opinion back or an email or something from people. Being in the presence of fellow humanists, of my fellow human beings, you have no idea what good medicine that is for an activist like me. So, I mean, everyone's been so gracious and kind with their words, but know that you taking time out of your Sunday to be here is such an honor, it's such a gift. It is a rush I will carry with me driving all the way home today in my car with the busted windshield as I pray for, uh, you know, traveling mercies as I get there. But it's, it's, it's something that I'm just struck by and know how grateful I am for you, for your friendship, for your support, for your challenge, and for your time and energies. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks, happy to have you here. Um, those of you that have returned and those that are here for the first time, we'd love to have you back, even when it's not Seth Andrews uh, speaking. So, uh, and in fact, you can be one of our speakers yourself. You know, sometimes we have people from the community speak. So uh, if you uh, didn't get one of the printed bulletins, although there's still a few lying around, you can take a look at the printed bulletin and see what activities we have going on during the week. We have stuff during the week. Uh, and if you want the bulletin emailed to you, then come up to me and I'll email you. So you have a PDF of the bulletin on your phone and you can keep in touch that way. Um, and if you get a chance to drop a little love in the hat back there, that would be great. We also have modern ways of giving, including QR codes and that sort of thing. And that's on a, uh, a little flyer in the back there. Uh, we do pay the musicians. We pay the speakers. We pay rent. And we're saving up to eventually have a, a building of our own someday. 
So, uh, and if you're not able to give, don't worry about it because the most important thing for us is just having you here. Thank you very much. All right. If you do give money, it reduces impurities, purity culture is the whole thing. We, um, we're going to have one final song from Jonathan and Bob. If, uh, lunch today is at the um, Kandahari Afghan restaurant on Hillcroft. Address is here. The lamb shank is to die for. It's so, so good. And the naan. Oh, oof. All the upcoming events are coming up here. If you're interested in plugging into uh, secular activism, talk to some people. Just plug into like secular groups in general. We would love to have you back. So as we have one last song from jonathan and bob we um bid you adieu and i'm so glad to see you all today and i uh, hope to see you in the near future Ah. Uh...